Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I am your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen. Thank you so much for listening today. Go check out reallifepharmacology.com. Get your free 31-page PDF, the top 200 drugs, great little study guide, uh, great review if you're out in practice. Uh, really uh, nice, uh, nicely put together on uh, some of the most common clinical pearls, adverse effects, things that you're actually going to see in practice, as well as things that uh, come up on board exams. So go get that for free, simply an email. Uh, we'll get you that, and we'll get you updates when we've got uh, new podcasts available and, and new content as well there. So again, you can do that at reallifepharmacology.com. All right, drug of the day today is Epoetin Alpha. Uh, brand name of this medication is Epogen Prokit Reticrit. Uh, this is a medication I've definitely seen uh, used in in practice. I would say uh, I've seen maybe less use as uh, time has gone on because we've seen uh, warnings and and different things come out with this medication. So it definitely has to be used uh, wisely and judiciously. And so hopefully I can teach you. Uh, some clinical practice pearls with uh, the use of this medication. All right, so you'll often hear um, uh, clinicians talk about ESAs. Uh, So that's erythropoiesis stimulating agents. And there are other medications within this class, but one of those is epoetin alpha, or epogen is probably the most common brand name I hear, hear used. So as the name implies, they stimulate erythropoiesis. So uh, essentially the drugs uh, stimulate the production of red blood cells. Uh, The drug causes the release of reticulocytes from bone marrow. So if you remember, reticulocytes are basically uh, kind of precursors or immature red blood cells uh, that eventually mature to erythrocytes. And uh, long story shorter, uh, what ends up happening is uh, epoetin causes the stimulation of and production of red blood cells, and that causes a rise in hemoglobin and hematocrit is primarily what we're going to be monitoring when we're tracking the effectiveness of this medication. Now, of course, we don't want to ignore the clinical aspect of it why we're giving these drugs is patients are usually significantly anemic and they're very symptomatic. So they're lethargic, uh, they don't have great color, things like that. Um, That's why this medication um, might be used. So more specifically, what type of situations uh, does that happen? And uh, in practice, they're, they're are a few different situations that you certainly could use epoetin alpha for, um, but the most common situations in practice are going to be related to cancer and chemotherapy, so anemia caused by that, uh, as well as anemia or drop in hematocrit and hemoglobin uh, due to chronic kidney disease. So those are two of the most common situations where I've seen this uh, medication used. So it is really, really important to make sure we're using the lowest effective dose. And I wanted to kind of focus here a little bit on CKD uh, and dosing um, and recognizing that uh, I've got a lot of patients in, in my practice who are anemic and anemic due to CKD. And they might have a hemoglobin anywhere from, you know, 10 to 11, kind of in that range. That's definitely common, particularly in geriatric patients but they really might not be that symptomatic. And so in patients like that, where that hemoglobin's in double digits and they're not really symptomatic, or maybe if they're even in high single digits and they're not symptomatic, we're probably not going to treat those patients because there are substantial risks. And I'll, I'll talk about those risks uh, coming up here, uh, but I wanted to focus a little bit on that dosing. So in CKD, um, typically the dosing is 50 to 100 units per kilogram, three times per week. And it's really, really important uh, to avoid going above 11 grams per deciliter. As we escalate that hemoglobin by using this medication, uh, there's a boxed warning for cardiovascular risk. So things like MI, stroke, DVTPE. 
And obviously that is a very, very serious thing to worry about. And so that is why these drugs are used very judiciously uh, in significant cases where patients have profound anemia um, and, and those type of situations. So I uh, mentioned the kind of the initial dosing, 50 to 100 units per kilogram, three times per week. Again, that's just in CKD. There's different dosing for uh, chemotherapy, cancer patients, that type of thing. Uh, but that just gives you a little bit of a, a frame of reference there. Uh, and again, it is weight-based uh, dosing there. Uh, given sub-Q IV, so if you got a patient on dialysis, because obviously they uh, have uh, CKD in that situation, um, we give that medication IV versus if they've got CKD and they're not on dialysis yet, um, that's where we would likely use uh, sub-Q administration. Now, as we go through this, I wanted uh, to think about and give you some examples of dose adjustments. So 25% is a, a good number to remember. So if that hemoglobin isn't responding, and that's generally considered a less than one gram per deciliter increase. So maybe it goes up by 0.2 grams per deciliter. So you go from uh, 8.1 to 8.3. Well, that's likely indicative of patient not responding. Um, and that could be due to multiple reasons. But if we were going to increase the dose and we assessed it wasn't due to other factors, just a low dose, um, we would target a 25% increase. So again, if the hemoglobin increase is less than one gram per deciliter over a four-week period, uh, we're going to increase the dose by 25%. If in any two-week period, and we're going to be monitoring hemoglobin here, obviously, if hemoglobin goes up more than one gram per deciliter in any two-week period, uh, it's recommended to decrease that dose by 25%. Okay, So we're going up too quickly on that hemoglobin. And again, that goes back to not wanting to increase those risks for MI and stroke and, and things like that. Uh, going a little bit deeper into uh, adverse effect profile. So hypertension can happen. Uh, if I see a patient that is having trouble managing their blood pressure, um, ESAs or a drug like epoetin is definitely one of the drugs I think about and look at and make sure that the patient uh, isn't on because it can definitely be a cause of drug-induced hypertension. Uh, GI adverse effects can happen, nausea and vomiting, uh, achy, injection site reactions. So kind of some of the, the you know generic flu-like symptoms can happen uh, from this injection, but really everything um, comes back to that box warning of cardiovascular events. Very severe uh, adverse effect boxed warning, um, heart attack, stroke, uh, big, big issue that we have to pay attention to. Uh, and one of the reasons why, you know, we're very cautious with this medication. All right. I wanted to talk about supplementation quick, because this is really, really uh, important. So I kind of mentioned that case of, you know, going from maybe they've been taking epoetin alpha their hemoglobin goes from 8.1 to 8.3. They don't seem to really be responding. It is absolutely critical that we look at uh, supplementation and making sure that other cofactors used in red blood cell production uh, are adequate in the body because uh, if we don't have that response, it certainly could be due to that. And in clinical practice, the most common situation is iron deficiency. So if there's not enough iron around for the uh, production of red blood cells, that's going to basically stifle the benefit of the medication. Uh, other considerations, B12, folate, uh, those are, are two other potential uh, deficiencies that may lead to kind of a non-response with epoetin alpha. Uh, talking kinetics a little bit, onset of action is 10 days, so you know don't give a shot of epoetin alpha and expect a response in two days. That's just not going to happen. It, it takes a little while for this drug to work. Uh, and then that, that peak effect, probably on average four weeks, uh, anywhere in the range of two to six weeks. Monitoring parameters, I've covered them a little bit already. Uh, hemoglobin hematocrit, that's what we're going to be following to adjust the dose um, and minimize the risk for that potential uh, cardiovascular issue with heart attacks and strokes. 
Also, what we're going to check out are iron stores, things like ferritin, uh, B12, and, and folic acid are also uh, monitoring parameters you're going to want to at least assess at the, the very beginning of giving uh, this medication at a, at a bare minimum there. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study materials like ambulatory care, BCPS, BCGP, uh, NAPLEX exam, if you're a pharmacy student, we've got a growing list of great resources, great content that have helped thousands, literally thousands now of people pass their board exam. So all those links, resources can be found at meded101.com slash store. Be sure to check back off and we do uh, add different content over time. Uh, if you're a nurse or a young uh, student going through pharmacology classes, maybe it's your first go round, uh, definitely go check out the MedEd 101 Guide to Nursing Pharmacology a uh, great introductory resource, very inexpensive. Uh, I put a lot of time into that book, a lot of effort, and really like this podcast, wanted to give you some of the most important uh, clinical pearls and stuff that actually happens in practice and stuff you're actually going to see uh, show up in your, board, in your board exams and nursing exams as you go throughout your nursing career or uh, healthcare career if you're in another field taking a pharmacology class. So definitely go check all those resources out. Uh, I've got others as well, uh, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. All right, wrapping up with drug interactions. So epoetin alpha doesn't have a lot of true drug interactions. So that is a really, really nice thing. Um, so what I'm looking for in this situation uh, drugs that may increase that boxed warning risk, so drugs that may raise blood pressure, uh, NSAIDs, estrogen, stimulants, uh, also drugs that may increase uh, clot risk, so things like birth control, uh, serms like tamoxifen used in breast cancer, uh, even something like smoking, which can increase uh, cardiovascular risks. Uh, that could have a potential additive effect and may place a patient at higher risk for some of those cardiovascular events. And then one last clinical pearl I wanted to mention uh, is that epoetin alpha and using ESAs or these type of agents can affect A1C labs. So in patients that we're monitoring that, in our diabetes patients, uh, it can artificially lower A1C. So if you've had a patient, you know, maybe they're uh, non-adherent with therapy or they, they've had a really tough time managing their diabetes they're always at you know a nine or a ten and all of a sudden you see them drop down for a six or six or a seven with no apparent reason uh, you might want to double check and make sure they're not taking uh, an ESA type agent like epoetin alpha so it can artificially lower a1c and the way we can do that obviously is to uh, keep tabs on their blood sugar and making sure that uh, those AccuChecks, those blood glucose checks um, align with what we're seeing uh, in the, the A1C because certainly we don't want somebody to uh, get severe hyperglycemia and risk for uh, DKA and things like that. So um, definitely one kind of unique clinical pearl with those diabetes patients is this drug can actually uh, artificially lower uh, A1C levels in lab monitoring. All right, well, that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. Hope you picked up some clinical practice pearls. Uh, as always, support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Also, go sign up, get your free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. Uh, and for more detail, uh, greater background, as well as some practice questions, uh, meded 101 guide to nursing pharmacology, great introductory resource for anybody uh, taking pharmacology classes or preparing for board exams. So uh, go check all those resources out, support this podcast, and support our sponsors. That's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, leave a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Greatly appreciate that. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.